Right? Do, do, you, do you know who it is? Faster, it's not underdog. Okay, so <clears throat> some of you have no idea who I even just said. Younger ones in particular. Faster than a speeding bullet. He can fly, he can walk through walls, he can pick up a truck, he wears a cape. His nickname is Robert Butterfield. Oh, no, sorry, Robert Butterfield's his nickname. Well, who is he? Superman. That's right. It's the title of our message today. Who is Superman? Go wear Robert Butterfield out. Try to hear his story. Why? That's his nickname, all right? Well, who we're talking about today, if you would, open your Bibles to Proverbs 13, 22. Proverbs 13, 22. And as you're doing that, um, I'm going to remind you once again, if you have any questions about this manual, it's what it looks like on the, on the Welcome Center out there. Volunteers or interested volunteers, just don't hesitate to ask, okay? Come see me um, and or Teresa, and we will talk with you. Or Coach, uh, happy to talk with you about that. Uh, We're going to talk today not about Superman, but about a two-word, Superman, a Superman. He's a Superman, why? Because he's God's man. Because he's God's man, he is a Superman. So in background, if you're new with us, we're studying through the book of Proverbs, and Solomon writes the book of Proverbs, and he takes the first nine chapters to introduce us to the importance of wisdom and why we need it. And then he takes the rest of the book, um, and it, which includes some other authors along the way, some other writers, includes the rest of the book to give us that wisdom in various categories or topics of life. In other words, the wisdom for how to live life. God's wisdom for how do I do life is in these repeated couplets or short three or four verses together, repeated chapter by chapter, about how we live out God's wisdom. And and some of them are identical as you go through the book, and some of them kind of add a new element along the way of what God is trying to tell us in wisdom with respect to that category. And one of those life categories, one of the most important, is the subject we're talking about today, represented by this side of the room, a family, a group of friends, playing a game, always a visual minder we want to have for you about what we're talking about, as well as the poster here. Um, it's family and friends. And within that category, as I mentioned last week, we're going to get more specific with each of the roles within the family. And then we're going to talk about friends as well. And the first one we're talking about is the man of the house. That's who we're looking at, God's man. What does it mean to be the God's man? What does it mean to be a man? Well, folks, the entire book of Proverbs, the whole book of Proverbs answers that question. How so? Because, again, to remind you, Solomon is a father. The original author who wrote most of it wrote this to whom? His son, about how to be a man of God. And so, what does a man of God look like? Study Proverbs, the whole book. And there you go. There's your instruction manual. And we, we, we are studying that. Um, and, and it's critically important because, folks, we've nearly lost that identity because of the false teaching in our culture about what a man is to be. Folks, in in America, our confusion began in the 1960s, as you well know. It gathered momentum in the 70s. It achieved politically correct status in the 80s. It went to the heart of legal turmoil in the 90s, and now it is part of the -the in-your-face, off-the-rails social reengineering since the turn of the century. In fact, Chuck Colson said this in 1991. He said, The fundamental pillar of our society, the family, has been under assault for years, and its crumbling has long been of vital concern to Christians. But do not miss the progression. The artillery salvos are escalating against something even more fundamental. He wrote this in 1991. He said, It's coming. 1991, you know how long ago that was. He says, It's coming. The escalation, and here it is. 
It's even more fundamental. It is the very notion of what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman. Folks, that assault is not an accident. That is Satan's plan intentional. Why is that? Here's why. Because God hates, excuse me, because Satan hates God. Satan hates God and he hates everything that God made. And God made humanity uniquely male and uniquely female. And, God, and Satan hates it. In fact, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, to our like, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in His own image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. He made them uniquely male and uniquely female in His image. Stu Weber said in 1977, he said, Satan loves dark tunnels, and he knows that this one, it's 1997, he knows that this one, this gender-destroying detour from God's intentions, has the potential to do more damage than we can begin to dream. Our ancient adversary knows very well what most of us have forgotten, that gender is one of the most basic and far-reaching expressions of the image of God, and the enemy loves nothing better than to distort the image of God he hates. Folks, the image of God is tied to the unity within diversity of human masculinity and femininity. Do you get that? The image of God is tied to the unity of masculinity and femininity that are each unique, but together they are unified. And Satan wants nothing more than to bend or blur that image of God because God gets glory from it. And he doesn't want God to get glory, so what Satan wants to do is to destroy the image of God within humanity. You know, isn't it strange that the nation who prides itself on diversity is working so hard to destroy its most basic form? Because once you remove that from gender, it becomes a free fall to remove it, diversity, from all of society. And you know what that is? That's one of the tenets of socialism. We've got to get rid of diversity and have everybody just alike. Folks, that's the very opposite of the kingdom of God. That tenet is the opposite of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not unity through uniformity. The kingdom of God is all about unity through diversity. We are different but united. James Dodson reminds us that, quote, in the thousands of years of human history and the thousands of different human cultures that have existed in human history, only a few have managed to blur masculinity and femininity, and every single one of them are now extinct. Folks, what's the fruit of all that? It's that our generation has no idea what manhood and womanhood mean anymore. Now, we're going to address womanhood next week. Today we're focusing on men. And, and there are some who think men are supposed to be these UFC beard guzzling bravados who have to defend the right to oppress women. Some of them believe that. And then the other extreme of that, of course, is that there's this, they've adopted this genderless, visionless attitude that, that uh, somehow accepts the lie that equality is based on function rather than essence. And what I mean by that is that there's the, the lie that, that your equality is based on what you do, not who you are. You don't have to do the same things to be equal. Satan would have us believe you do. So we have in our culture thousands of men who want to rule their wives and other women like dictators. And then we have others who passively stand by, abdicate their responsibility, and serve themselves. Basically what that means is, in other words, men don't know how to be men anymore. Well, I can tell you, my dear friends, there is no way in the world that this half-century crisis is going to be answered in a single sermon, much less it, it, not even the whole series. It's not. <clears throat> That's a lifetime of devotion to God's Word, to seeking the answers in His Word. Folks, listen to me. Instead of letting culture, especially Hollywood and Washington, direct our theology, Christians need to let the Bible direct their theology through the study of His Word daily and monthly and annually. And that just, yes, that's right, that deserves a round of applause. Why are we letting Washington and Hollywood tell us what 
God has to say about manhood and womanhood. They're bankrupt. Are they not? Look at their lives and their marriages. What in the world? Why would we do that? Folks, God wants us to use our brains and read His Word. And the more and more we keep turning to the internet or the television to answer things for us, the more vulnerable we become to being led to the slaughterhouse by those who are under Satan's deceptive thumb. So here are the bare bones. Today we're going to talk about just the bare bones, simple beginning of rediscovering manhood, how to be a super man. Ladies, do not tune out. <clears throat> we'll get to you next week. <clears throat> No, but ladies, you need to pay attention to this too. Why? Because some of you are raising boys or grandsons. How do you raise them? And some of you are doing that by yourself because you either are by yourself or you are the spiritual leader by yourself in your home. It also tells you, ladies, what to pray for, for your husbands, for your dads if they're still with us, for your sons and your grandsons. It tells you how to pray. If you're not married yet, it tells you who to look for. What kind of man do I need to seek to spend the rest of my life with? So, let's pay attention. A super man, folks, first, loves Jesus. A super man loves Jesus. Have you ever heard this term, play the man? Play the man? It's a very, it, listen, listen, that's a very well-known historical term that you don't hear a lot lately because it's out of vogue. They want to say it now. <clears throat> On the cobblestones of Broad Street in Oxford, England, there is embedded a simple cross. And it marks the road to one of the world's most prestigious universities. Why is it there? It's a memorial. It is a memorial to two men who displayed manhood. It was October, a crisp morning in 1555. Two men... <clears throat> who refused to recant or dismiss or deny their personal faith in Jesus Christ, were led from Bacardo prison into the sunlight for their last day on earth. They had been sentenced to be burned at the stake because they would not deny their faith in Jesus. And we have no idea what all they were thinking, but we do have recorded historically what, we, what people, the crowd, heard them say. Hugh Latimer, one of them, turned to Nicholas Ridley, the other, and said this. He said, be of good cheer, Ridley. Play the man. Play the man. He says, we shall this day light such a candle by God's grace as I trust shall never be put out. They're gonna be, and they were burned at the stake. He said, let's play the man and light a candle. The world cannot forget. For Jesus. Play the man. Three words. One point that needs to be heard and adopted again today. But Latimer didn't make those words up. Because hundreds of years earlier, in the second century, one of our Christian fathers named Polycarp was marched into a Roman stadium to be executed at the stake for his faith in Jesus. And historical accounts say that there was as he came as he entered the stadium that a voice from heaven was heard saying be strong polycarp and play the man latimer was remembering the dying dignity of polycarp and what qualities of manhood was he trying to forget to to get his friend ripley to focus on as they marched to the stake and you know what it was what does it mean to be a man? To be God's man. But listen, this is neat. I want you to look up 1 Kings chapter 2 with me for a minute. So hold your place in Proverbs 13. And look with me at 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. I don't believe this will be on the screen, so if you want to see this. In fact, I would make a note beside Proverbs 13, 22 of this reference, 1 Kings 2, 1 through 4. You see, what does it mean to be a man... Even farther back than Polycarp, we see a similar phrase. Here it is. Here's what it says in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1. When David's time to die, David, that's King David of Israel, right? You with me? When his time to die drew near, he commanded Solomon his son, saying, 
I am about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong and show yourself a man. Play the man, Solomon. Keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in His ways, keeping His statutes, His commandments, His rules, His testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. That the Lord may establish His word that He spoke concerning me, saying, if your son pays close attention to their way, to walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. David's time to die, he commanded Solomon. Solomon, that's the guy that wrote Proverbs, or most of it. He's the guy we're studying. The guy who is the father who's passing wisdom on to his son. And he is recounting, he's remembering the words of his father. And and the words of his father, David said, Be a man, be a man of God to your sons and your grandsons, to your to your grandchildren. Show, show even your granddaughters what it means to be a man. Pass them on. Now, in Proverbs 13, verse 22, it says, A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. The sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous. You remember, we, we've studied this before. Jesus redefined wealth in the New Testament for what it means. It, it doesn't mean specifically material things. When he says, leave them an inheritance, folks, he is talking about greater things. Specifically, he is talking about passing on a spiritual inheritance that, in, that, that affects every area of their life. Every area of their life. Folks, we're to pass on a spiritual inheritance to our children and our grandchildren. If we don't want to see our culture and our world fall apart, then Christians need to pass on a spiritual inheritance to their children and their grandchildren. The rest of the world isn't going to do it. In fact, they're going to do everything they can to influence your children and grandchildren to follow Satan's culture. And, and remember this, when it comes to sin and idolatry, what parents do in moderation, the children will do to extreme. It's critical we pass on that inheritance. Are we? Are we doing that? Are we showing them that it's more important to worship Jesus, our Savior, or our traditions? Are we showing them that it's more important to pursue the Lord or to pursue sports? What are you passing on? What are you telling them are are the priorities of life? Because what you tell them in moderation is what they take to extreme. Honestly. What priorities are you teaching them? It has generational implications, and real men love Jesus. To be a man of God, love Jesus. Now, when I say that, I know I run the risk of tuning some men out. Love Jesus? I mean, saying a guy should love another guy is kind of awkward. <laughs> well, you know, do you know why? It's because, of a, it's because of the gender confusion in our culture. Who's monkeyed this thing up so bad? And sometimes even in church. Some churches, listen to me, it's sad but it's true, some churches have jettisoned so much masculinity that much of our culture thinks church is just for women and children. That's one thing I love about CTO. They remind us it's not. It's for men as well as women and children. Last night, CTO held their annual banquet in the Hope Center. Many of you, and Teresa and I included, were, able, were, were in attendance. And as we had that annual banquet, um, Dwayne said, we, we, don't, we, we lead these young boys and, and even girls who come along the way, but, but their primary focus unapologetically is to teach men to be boys to be men. And he said, here's what he says, he said, we, we lead them to Jesus, but we don't leave them. We don't leave them. We teach and we mentor those boys to be men of God for life. We disciple them for life. We teach them to love God, to love their wife, to serve their community, and to share the hope of, the, uh, the hope of Jesus with those who don't. And we had personal testimonies from young men who've been through it who follow that. I love that. I appreciate y'all more than I can say. And praise God, they were able to put together to, to, to raise about $15,000 last night for that ministry to reach boys. 
and girls for the gospel. And I know on their behalf, they would say the same to you. Thank you, Twin Lakes, for your support, hosting that event, hosting them right here in our church every, every Sunday, and, and then, of course, financially supporting them. But listen, I know they would agree with this as much as they love it. You don't have to hunt and fish to be a man or a man of God. You do not. You can be a great chef. You can write poetry. You don't have to do that just to be a man. But there are some things that you do need to be a man. Recovering masculinity is about a love where men have a bond of brotherhood that sacrifices for one another, whatever their affinities or hobbies. Jesus said a friend does what if he loves him? Will lay down his life. I I can't tell you how many military men over the years in church, especially those who are in some of our black ops groups or Navy SEALs, have said to me, sometimes I struggle to find in the church what I had in the SEALs. Isn't that sad? And then they would describe a brotherhood where men will lay down their lives for men where we will give to one another no matter what it costs. Well, folks, if it ought to be anywhere, it ought to be in the church. Jesus is the one who displayed what that looks like above all in history. And It begins with, the only way it's possible, it begins with loving the Lord Jesus enough to follow Him and to honor Him. Like David told Solomon, be a man of honor. Honor God's Word. Follow Him as a good soldier of the cross. Proverbs 13, 13, this same chapter says, whoever despises the word brings destruction to himself. That's the word of God. But he who reveres the commandment will be rewarded. He who reveres the commands of God will be rewarded. Do you revere God's word? Do you study it, men? Men, do you study it? Do you revere it? Not just on Sunday, but for your life, the manual of your life, do you make it a priority? Priority? Do you honor God by obeying it? Loving Jesus looks like that. In fact, Jesus said it plainly, John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Then the reverse would be true. If you don't keep his commandments, you don't love him. Loving Jesus looks like that. Loving Jesus, let me just share a few more of these with you. Loving Jesus, men, looks like confessing sin. That's what it looks like. Proverbs 28, 13 says, He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Loving Jesus looks like trusting in the Lord. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. And loving Jesus means loving discipline. For the sake of time, we're not going to have all these on the screen. So if you're keeping notes, just just jot these down. I'm going to go quickly through them. Let me give you several more. It means the man of God controls his temper. That's Proverbs 25, 28. Just get the Scripture verse. You'll get the meaning when you read it. Being a man of God means loving discipline. Loving deep discipline means controlling your temper. Proverbs 25, 28. You want to be a man of God? You want to be a real man? It means you don't brag, Proverbs 27, 2. It means you don't break confidence, Proverbs 20, 19. It means you're generous, Proverbs 14, 21. Remember what we said Solomon is doing? He's teaching his young boy how to be a man. It's all over the place. It means you're honest, Proverbs 11, 1. It means you're patient, 16, 32. And I love this. Being a man of God means you're not controlled by what others think about you. Proverbs 29, 25. Real men love Jesus. So a superman loves Jesus. You know what else? A superman loves his wife. He does. You said that last night, Dwayne. Not only did you say it, you showed it. Then you brought Marlene up and talked, and, and, and you did exactly what this verse says. Not because you wanted me to put you in a sermon this morning. <laughs> but because you've learned it through your walk with Jesus. And you and I know each other's story a long way back. You know a time when you didn't. I know a time when you didn't. And I know a time in my life when I didn't either. Superman loves his wife. Being a husband's a difficult job, is it not? Oh, my goodness. She's sitting with me. Being a husband is a difficult job. 
Because you have to watch everything you say. Because she remembers it. <laughs> Hello? There was a guy coming to a counselor's office, and he, he, he went to the pastor, and he said, his pastor, was, he, for, for some counseling, he says, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do. My wife is so historical. He said, you mean hysterical? No, she's, his, she's historical. She never forgets anything I say. <laughs> 20 years ago. It's difficult. So we, last week we watched this clip from the B family. Um, being care- this is this is one that reminds us you had to be careful what you say. You know you're just like your say it. No. I will remember. You're not mad at me. No. You're sure. I'm fine. Okay, cool. Cause I thought. I will remember. Top of the line, baby. You're gonna love it. A scale. I will remember. Wow, I lost five pounds. Nice, 25 to go. Five more to go. I will remember. Cut the grass. You never listen to anything hey, I say. Relax. I will remember. These pants are really tight. Did you put them in the dryer? No, but I could put you on a treadmill. I will remember. We're a team. We're a dynamic duo. She's my side chick. Side chick! I will remember. Happy Valentine's Day! Because you're hot and steamy. I will remember. Why can't you be more like Jimmy's wife? What? I said what? I will remember. Hi, I'd like to order flowers for my wife. I wanted to say, baby, I love you, and you're the only one for me. I will. You were right. I was wrong. <laughs> oh yes! <laughs> I will. Remember. All right, pick a partner. Gotta be careful, right? <laughs> oh, too, too good of an opportunity not to put some, some humor to remind us. <laughs> what does loving your wife look like? It means watching what you say, but, but, but let's dig a little deeper in Scripture here. Loving your wife means being a spiritual leader. Loving your wife, which means being a superman, which means being a man of God, means being the spiritual leader in your home. If you're married to a Christian woman, there's nothing more she wants than for you to be a Christian leader in your home instead of her having to do what God assigned you to do. You know how hard it is to do something you weren't designed to do? Your wife wants you to be the person God wants you to be, and that means to be the spiritual leader. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church, and He gave Himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with washing of the water by the Word. That phrase, cleansing with water by the word, strange term maybe for us to try to understand. Ultimately, what he's saying is, husbands, you're to be the Christ example to your wife in your home. And, and, and to, to the washing of the water of the word, what does Christ do with the word of God? He cleanses and perfects us. He matures us. So what he's saying is, husbands, it's your responsibility to help your wife grow in the Lord. And the primary way you do that is, by lead, is leading by example. You lead her by showing her what it means to follow Christ. If she's having to lead you, something's wrong. You say, you're being a little mean. I'm just being biblical. I love you enough. Listen, what does Jesus say? If you follow His Word, you will know the truth, and the truth will what? I don't want you to be deceived. Be free. Do what it says. If you want the home God wants you to have, then man up. Be who God wants you to be, who He's called you to be, who whether or not you know it is equipping you to be if you're a believer. And if you're not, you can be. We'll get to that in a minute. Help her grow by example. And do you know what the number one way He helps her grow by example? He serves. He serves. He serves His home. He serves His kids. And listen, men, to be, to be a follower of Jesus means you serve your wife. That's why Pastor Sam's not here this morning. He's doing exactly what God's called him to do. First and foremost. His first priority is to serve his wife. Which is what he's doing this morning. Why he called me at 6. He wanted to serve the Lord by serving the church. And by 6 o'clock this morning, God says, the first place you need to be is with Annette. And, and Sam is right. He knew it. I've been interviewed by churches, including Sam and Annette before. And often I have I have given them a question most of them forgot to ask. 
or didn't ask. Not that Sam and Annette didn't, but <clears throat> I have had some that didn't. <laughs> we talked about it with Sam and Annette, and it's this. I just phrase it this way, and usually I'm right out of the gate with it and just say it, even whether it's in the interview or not. Here's the question. If we're considering you to come on staff with us or to be our pastor, here's the question. Would you ever leave this church for your wife? And I said, in a heartbeat. Why? That's my first priority. In fact, the Bible says I can't pastor the church if I can't do that with my wife, for my wife. That's number one <clears throat> on the list. I'd just be bold. God, listen, God can give me another church. He does not want me to have another wife. She's the priority. We're to serve her. <clears throat> Loving your wife means keeping your marriage covenant. Chapters 2, 5, 6, and 7, which we'll talk about in another category, all talk about the danger of unfaithfulness. Proverbs 23, 26, and 7 says, My son, give, your heart, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways, for a prostitute is a deep pit and a stranger is a narrow well. What's that mean? It means a super man doesn't need to flirt with a woman at work because he loves his wife. A super man, a man of God, guards his communication with other women. And he doesn't need, if he's married, he doesn't need to message an old girlfriend from high school on Facebook. It means he guards his eyes and he guards his son's eyes from pornography because porn warps our minds. It views sex selfishly and it views women as objects. In fact, great pastor Tony Evans in Dallas, Texas said pornography use, listen to this, pornography use is one of the greatest indicators that a man has lost touch with his own manhood because he has to piggyback on the intimacy of others. Loving your wife means praising her. We read this last week. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. I said this last week, I'll say it again. It means he doesn't put her down, he doesn't find fault, he doesn't condemn, he doesn't complain. His tone is bright, positive, and life-giving. She is excellent in his eyes, and she knows it because he tells her regularly. <laughs> Finally, a superman loves his children. Proverbs 13 again, verse 24, says, Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Now, we're going to deal, deal more with parenting um, in a couple of weeks. But, <clears throat> so just briefly, since we're going to dig deeper later, a superman means, and he loves his kids, and it means he's not lazy with his responsibilities when it comes to parenting. He teaches kids how to walk, he teaches them how to talk, he teaches them how to drive a car, how to do a job interview, how to read scripture, how to respect those in authority. Probably need to say that in our culture again. How to respect those who are in authority. <clears throat> Have we ever lost touch with that? Amen. How to be generous. <clears throat> how to love others. He teaches and He corrects. By the way, you can respect those who are in authority even if you don't like them. You can still be respectful. The superman teaches his children responsibility and he teaches them to marry someone who is responsible. For Proverbs 12, 11 says, Those who work their land will have abundant food, but those who chase fantasies have no sense. <laughs> Sometimes Proverbs is funny, but it's true. <clears throat> there is a, there's a missionary family who served overseas, and they, they came home for fur furlough. They've been serving for a long time, and oh, they just needed a refresher and a break. It's so hard, especially in some difficult countries, um, to live out our faith and, and to help people. And So a generous family of friends provided a summer home on the lake for them to stay in for a few weeks. And it's summertime, and they're in this summer home, and I mean, it's just gorgeous. It's like the Garden of Eden. They were so blessed by that generosity. Well, one particular morning, mom was fussing in the kitchen with the baby, and dad was tinkering around uh, out in the boathouse, and the other three kids were playing in the lawn where they could see them, and and in just a moment, and you know how things can happen in a moment, those kids got out of sight of both parents, for, I mean, just for seconds. And the, uh, the, uh, the two older kids, 
um, got distracted themselves while playing, and they lost their eyesight of the youngest of the three out, outside. He was three-year-old little Billy. <clears throat> well, little Billy was looking down at the boat dock, and he saw something shiny and decided he'd better go check that out. <clears throat> so he made his way down to the boat dock and out on the boat dock and then decided that neat, shiny-looking thing, which was an aluminum boat, ought to be something he ought to be in. So he went to step off of the dock and into the boat, and when he did, he lost his balance and fell into six-foot water, murky water, by the dock. Well, Dad heard the splash, ran out to the dock, dove into the murky water. He couldn't see anything. It's so dark. He ran out of air searching. Finally, he burst back to the surface. Billy's still gone. Can't find him. He took another breath. Went down again, and he's hunting, and he's hunting. And the only thing he could do is he's about to run out of air again is to just stick his arms and legs out everywhere and try to feel because he can't see. <clears throat> and as he run, was running out of air on his way back up, he felt little Billy under the water, and little Billy was three feet under with a, in a death grip around one of the piers on that dock. <clears throat> so he pried that little boy's fingers loose from that pier, and they both burst to the surface and got a breath of air. Little Billy was fine. He'd been holding his breath that whole time. <laughs> and he was okay. <clears throat> Dad carried him around, holding him for a long time. Everything's okay. Everybody settled down. And when everything got settled down and was calm, Dad asked Billy a powerful question. He said, Billy, what on earth were you doing down there hanging on to that post far under the water? <clears throat> And Billy's answer reaches out and grabs us by the throat. He said, just waiting for you, Dad. Just waiting for you. Men, Billy's saying, Dad, Grandpa, I'm just waiting for you. I knew you'd come. I knew you'd rescue me. I knew you'd be there for me because you're my dad. You're my hero. You're my grandpa. You're my hero. In some cases, you're my uncle. You're my hero. And you might just be that spiritual dad. You're my hero. I knew you wouldn't leave me. And you know what, men? Our wives are saying the same thing. Hey, I'm just waiting for you, honey. I knew you'd be there for me. I knew you wouldn't leave me. I knew you'd rescue me. Our wives, our kids, folks, I believe our nation need us to play the man. To be a super man. They are just waiting for us to be the men of God He intends for us to be. Well, men, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? you bow with me this morning? You know, you might you might be here and say, I don't, I don't even know how to be that man. Well, you won't if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, because that's what it means. To be a superman means to be the men that God designed us. So He's our creator. He, he, he designed us to be, not the culture. Don't let the culture dictate to you. You know that's not working. Be the men God's called you to be, and you can't do that without a relationship with Him. And the only way to have a relationship with God is through His Son, Jesus Christ. And that begins with repentance. What's that mean, Pastor? That means I say, God, I'm right. Excuse me, God, you're right, and I'm wrong. And I know it. <clears throat> there are things in my life and ways I'm living that I know do not honor you and that you don't agree with. And even deep inside, I know that. I, I don't even know much about your book, but I know enough. And you will. He'll tell you. He, you know. <clears throat> I know I'm not right with Him and I know I need Him. Or it might be simply this. You know you can't do it. You just know you need Him. Well, what do I repent of in that case? Pride. God, I just need you to be boss instead of me. I'm sorry. Well, ask Him to forgive you. He will. If you mean it, He will. All you have to do is say, Lord, <sighs> thank You for Jesus 
who actually was punished for my pride and my sin on a cross so that God's justice could be satisfied and I could be forgiven. My place could be exchanged. That's the goodness of God. He is just and He is right. He's perfect. He says there's a consequence, as there should be, a discipline for sin. But in His grace, He allowed His Son to take Jesus to take that discipline on our behalf so we could be forgiven. Justice satisfied, grace offered, forgiveness. Can't earn it. You'll never earn it. Can't. It's a gift. You may want to ask Him right now where you're sitting to forgive you of your sins. It's simple words. And it's not even the words. It's the, it's the heart's decision. Christian men, boys, maybe it's, maybe it's the Lord saying, you know what, you just need to recommit yourself to Him or an area of your life to Him. We heard testimony at CTO last night of a young man who just did that. He was following the Lord, but there's some areas he didn't discuss what they were and he didn't have to where he said, you know what, I just everybody know, I, I, I just I need to make a decision to be more faithful to God in some things. And you need to tell him that. That's a decision. <clears throat> Down the wrong track, God, your spirit is telling me, mm, this is what I need to get right. In just a minute, <clears throat> following my prayer, we'll take the Lord's Supper together as we, before we're dismissed. And for all of us, we need to be men and women who love Jesus. He's our example because He gave everything. He served and He gave His life for us. He is why we can be forgiven because He died on a cross for us and offers us forgiveness. Today is actually Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement in the Old Testament, which pointed to Jesus, the sacrifice for sin. God takes sin seriously. There's consequences, death. In the Old Testament, an animal died so God's justice could be satisfied. But it always pointed to Jesus, God's Son who would die on our behalf, who did. And then Jesus gives us, <clears throat> before He goes to the cross, a visual reminder that we'll celebrate in just a minute of what He's done for us. Let's pray. First of all, if you don't know Jesus as Savior, you can pray something like this. Dear God, I know I have sinned. I know I need Your help. Ultimately, I know I need You to change me, God. That can't happen without You. I need a relationship with You. I believe Your Son, Jesus, died on the cross and rose from the dead. I don't understand how, but I believe it. And I accept Your forgiveness through Your Son, Jesus, and I wish to follow Him throughout my life. I don't know how, God, but I need and I want that today. Christian brothers, men, what is it God is saying to you you need to bring to Him today? Something you need to confess to Him, to get right with Him? Something you need to commit to, just something you need His help with. God, I just need to, I need to grow in this area. And women, how about you? What is God saying to you? It might have been nothing that came from the sermon today whatsoever, but God spoke to you through a song, through a thought, through a scripture that we read. What do you need to get right with Him this morning? What do you need His help with? Father God, on behalf of our <clears throat> brothers and sisters in the Lord and Christians, pray Your Spirit, <clears throat> first of all, would speak to us anything, Lord, that is lacking that we need to get right with You today, to be the men and women and children of God that You, that you have called us to be, that indeed You will enable us to be. God, I pray there's something in the way of that. We would repent of that. And we would turn and trust in You, Lord, to change us. And we may stumble. We may stumble before the day is over, but we know who to turn to and we will again. Help us, Lord. Some of us today, God, need to plant a flag. Lord, we, we, we need today to be a, a significant marker in our life that, that God, we, we know what you've said and we want to follow you. And I pray, Father, that you would stamp that on our heart today. God, as we take the Lord's Supper in a moment, we thank You for this reminder that we couldn't be anything without You. We'd be hopeless without You, but by Your grace, You love us so much that even though we have failed and even though we continue to stumble, it is through the blood of Jesus we are forgiven. And it is through the Holy Spirit that Jesus sends that we can keep going. We can keep growing and even though we might say we keep trying, it is not in our strength, but in yours, we are dependent on to change us. 
thank you, God, for that reminder today. In Jesus' name we pray.